If you're joining us today for the first time, this is part four of a multi-part series designed to help introduce and discuss the source material for the HBO show Watchmen. If you're unfamiliar with the story, or you like to start your stories from the beginning, you may want to see our episode on issue one. Welcome to Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen, the show where we watch the HBO show Watchmen. I am Scott. I am Sam. And welcome everybody to our fabulous recap of the original source material for the HBO show Watchmen. Hey, we do it the best here, I think. Nobody does it better than us. Yeah. Nobody has as much free time as us, and no one's <laughs> going to talk about Watchmen for as long as us. Those are the rules. That's how you play the game. <laughs> and play it we shall. Yes, just like Scott said, ladies and gentlemen, we are here watching The Watchmen. Uh, we are going to start out with the original material um, from Alan Moore, Dave Givens, and John Higgins. And we are going to go chapter by chapter, just you know, describing each issue. Um, and just going into like the different themes and the... Um, the stuff that goes into what they were trying to do as far as, um, you know, comic book um, lore back in 1985. 84 Absolutely. and 85. Yes, the 80s, the mid-80s, a time when shoulder pads were broad and hair was big. That's, how, that's right. That's what the 80s were like as far as I know. Pretty much. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't remember much of the 80s. Some of the action of this is set on my second birthday, oh, uh, just, as a, <laughs> just as a, uh, oh, man. you know, a, a <laughs> commentary here. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't remember too much about 1985 personally. Um, you know, we like to start over here uh, on the Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen podcast uh, on these recaps. You know, uh, I've been having my wife read along with us just because I like to get a new a new fresh perspective because I've read the thing so many times. Right. And uh, she she did something funny today, which is she actually uh, she marked the end of chapter three, which she was going to read, and then started reading chapter four. She started reading where she marked the end, uh-huh. and uh, so she had a lot of questions about what was going on. Okay, uh, so I had her. <laughs> so I, once we figured out that's what happened, which uh-huh. I, it could happen to anybody. Okay, uh, I had her go back and reread chapter three, uh, and okay. uh, she had some comments. Okay, I, I uh, bet she did. <laughs> yeah, she did. One one of her main comments was, "It really wouldn't hurt to read up on your war history before you read this." <laughs> <laughs> just to get a little bit of context. <laughs> yeah, just to kind of do a little, a little, a little second half of the you know twentieth uh, century review. Right. Uh, she thought that would be something that would be very helpful. <laughs> um, she believes. Okay, this is all stuff she thinks. So I don't consider this to be a spoiler because she doesn't have any information. Right. So all, none of this information. This is all speculative. It's just thoughts of hers okay. that I thought were interesting. Okay. Uh, so when. Um, she, did, she didn't like when they started packing up the apartment and Lori was all mad and uh, Forbes is like, your meal ticket's gone. She hated that. <laughs> she didn't like that. <laughs> she didn't like that. She thought okay. that, was, that, was, that was cruel. Uh, <laughs> okay. She thought, uh, she believes Rorschach is uh-huh. uh, the end is nigh guy because the, that guy gets and delivers a paper at the okay. end of the third chapter. Really? They, they, she deduced him because of, I mean, that because of that? Okay. Mm. That's what she's thinking. That's what she's thinking. She also said they seem to be in sync. And that Rorschach has a sort of like uh, like discouragement uh-huh. with the world that is echoed in that guy. Really? Huh. She okay, I have to, to look back and see. I don't know how she connected to like that, but I guess hey. I guess we'll see. Speculation, speculation. You know, yeah. it's free. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, she's very curious about Rolf, the Hood of Justice strongman. Okay. Hmm. And, okay. And <laughs> and here's what she had to say about about the. Uh, about how chapter three ended. She said, mm-hmm. it would make sense that you would have to kill the comedian because he would never relent or give up. So it makes sense you'd have to kill him. But Dr. Manhattan's indestructible, so the only way to get rid of him is to make him go into exile. That's what she... Wow, okay. That's what she said. Mm. And, I, and I, you know, that's just... Those are direct quotes. I remember I typed those out directly. <laughs> she was, we are <laughs> she definitely going to have her on the podcast, guys. Um, these mm-hmm. are some... Hmm. Uh, for those that were actually read the watch, uh, you know, Watchmen and everything, um, I think she's starting off really good so far. So we'll see yeah, how this, know, this this goes on, and um, you know, some stuff, eh, you know, but um, but but we'll see how <laughs> she progresses. <laughs> Absolutely, it's so it's so neat to watch, you know, uh, her get really into it. Mm-hmm. You know, when we record. I use I, and this is something I would assume I, our audience would hope we do. I use the I have the book sort of next to me, so you may hear. Uh, other than my dog, uh, you may hear you know some pages <laughs> ruffling around. She's kind of mad at me right now because I have the book. 
<laughs> while I'm doing the podcast right, so she right. can't read it. Oh, that's funny. Uh, that's funny. Yeah, so she's really into it. So, you know, again, again thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much, dear, uh, for reading, uh, reading along with us and uh, helping us. Yeah. Really keep grounded so that everybody knows what's happening. And for those outside that are actually doing the same thing, just reading along for the first time and, and you know, going along with Holly, you know, um, um, for the different plot points and different, um, you know, trying to just figure out the different mysteries that go along with it. Uh, we thank you guys as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And we'd love to hear from you. Yep. And so, speaking of hearing, do that, <laughs> <laughs> doing a little bit of housekeeping, um, yeah. you can um, email us at uh, Watching Watchmen at nerdcyclopedia.com. You can also um, do your regular emails to nerdcyclopedia at um, <laughs> at nerdcyclopediapodcast at gmail.com. Um, mm-hmm. You can follow us on our social media platforms, um, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, you, We got a YouTube channel now. And that's we at, do. Um, yes, we do. Yep, yep, absolutely. Um, Nerdcyclopedia. Mm. And, um, of course, at, you know, Twitter and Facebook, at Nerdcyclopedia. We mm-hmm. also have a, um, a Watching Watchmen Facebook group. It is called Sam and Scott are Watching Watchmen. Join us. Um, or You're Facebook. To yes, you are obligated. Point. There's no, there's no more options. <laughs> not at to. all, not at all. We love to um, get the community going about this and <laughs> getting the feedback because we cannot wait until this show comes out. You know, We're and so does excited. and and you know, hopefully, hopefully they can do the um, you know, the original material justice. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and you know, uh, we also have our feed on Twitter. Uh, Sam is so exhaustive there. I almost only have the one. It's our uh, Watching Watchmen. Uh, Sam has got our Watching Watchmen Twitter uh, Twitter account, which is Watchmen Podcasts One. That's the podcast spelled with a one instead of a T. That's what they gave us. We did not qualify for the T. All right. Okay. <laughs> so that's, now that we got that uh, out the way. Absolutely. So, nerd psychos, we know you've been waiting for us uh, to get to this one. This is a. Big old chapter here, episode four. Pretty, pretty, pretty dense here. Uh, episode four, uh, which I will be calling uh, Dr. Manhattan is from Mars, and uh, and women are from various places on Earth. Multiple places there. <laughs> That's right. Uh, okay, so one thing, you know, we talked last time, mm-hmm. uh, we talked about the covers a little bit, right? Okay, yep, and yep. Something I noticed, and I know we were talking about how the first, the first, um, the first panel uh-huh. of the first page is usually the, the cover of the comic. Yeah. yeah. But this time it looks like it's the second panel. Yes, I did notice that. So yeah. the first, the first, um, um, the cover um, goes into you know the lady and the man. I mean, mm-hmm. you know the couple, and they're eating mm-hmm. popcorn, and you know it's a um, purple, looks like sand, you know, and we see feet um, and mm-hmm. rocks. So we don't know. Well, if you read the last issue, obviously you know he left the planet, <laughs> right? Right. And we he's now on Mars. So this first panel, instead of ac- actually going into the picture, you know, gr- mm-hmm. um, zooming out, we actually get um, Doctor Manhattan looking at the picture with his hand. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is that panel, right? Mm-hmm. What he's ca- you know that countdown on the first page where he's going ten sec, you know, ten seconds, seven seconds. Yeah. And then it gets to the end of the first page. Mm-hmm. Those panels are identical to the cover. So what he's counting down to on the first page is that panel that's the cover. Wow. Wow. It's pretty deep. Wow. I mean, I've, listen, guys. Wow. The, the reason we picked this wow. particular medium is because wow. it is deep. Wow. I, I, I didn't even pick. You, it's, okay. So I've read this these books multiple times you know since it came out and it actually took me a while to actually get into the Watchmen when I first read it um Mm. back in the later 80s um but you it's just new stuff you pick up all the time I didn't even know that Scott (laughs) yeah I feel I'm proud of myself for that one deep (laughs) deep 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 so it's also out of order, and I think uh-huh. that's another thing that's important. I, I feel like before we jump into the plot summary, because there's a lot, like this is a dense, a lot of things we find out about, like the history of Doctor Manhattan and who mm-hmm. he is and how he got here and his origin. Uh-huh. In many ways, this is this you could really think of episode four or chapter four or issue four. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can think of this as kind of like Doctor Manhattan number one. Okay, like that's that's like almost the way issue, I like to huh? think of this. Hmm, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So it's him telling his origin story, right? But it's it's all you know. He experiences things different than humans. Right. And I think that's that's what you got to say before you really start talking about this. Mm-hmm. To Dr. Manhattan, time isn't a one – like a, we, we almost experience time like we're in a river. And the current's carrying mm-hmm. us one direction. We can only move in that one direction, right? Mm-hmm. But oh. he doesn't. He experiences things 
all at the same time. So his entire life, like, instead of remembering something and going back into storage, he just is experiencing things didactically constantly. So would so you consider sees, that like a like a linear type of structure? Like, you know, we experience stuff in linear, you know. Well, he, he it's almost like he's he sees his time as like a circle. And he okay. can go to like, grab any any end of the circle, any edge of it from mm-hmm. the center whenever yeah. he wants. Mm. Uh, and so when he when he goes places, the fourth dimension is something that he can experience in multiple ways. So it's almost like when he uh, when he's in the bar in 1985, right? Uh-huh. When he's in the bestiary. Then we're jumping around a little bit just to kind of dis- we'll get into the details here. But he's in this bar uh-huh. in 1985, and he experiences going into the bar in 1958 and 1985 at the same time. Oh wow! Okay. So so that spatial that that third dimensional relationship, he experiences the fourth dimension a lot like that. So he can revisit places and times that he's experienced just like how we can go like i can go back to where i went to high school right uh-huh. i can go to that place i can't go back to what how you know how you know fit and attractive i was when i was in high school which is, <laughs> which is not you know a shame and stuff uh but i can go back to where i was right right so i think what, what this is telling us is for, for dr manhattan you know seeing the future seeing the past seeing seeing his present it's about occupying a different space in the fourth dimension right and he can sort of he can sort of he can sort of tunnel his perception along those lines and so he can see the future, but, you know, he doesn't, in a lot of cases, he doesn't act to change the future because he recognizes that his actions are what led to the future being what happens. So it, it, whatever, I guess, whatever happens, happens. <laughs> yes. You know, as far as that. So so in your high school, um, you know, in your high <laughs> school um, description, metaphor or whatever, um, it's as if you're talking to me right now, but mm-hmm. you're experiencing your high school days and years or whatever your your high school time as if is what's happening right now right. vice versa right right so it would be like like we're talking now about my high school experience and at the same time well i could tell you what i was doing and exact like i could remember exactly what was happening exactly the way it was happening so i would be experiencing it all simultaneously simultaneously that's the so it would word. be like if i could say yes so it'd be like if, if I could talk, I could channel a three-way conversation. Like you could talk to me, you could talk to someone I was talking to then, and talk back, right? Yep. So so, and and that and, and that's because he's he's sort of found a way to sort of exist outside of the dimension of reality that humans are tethered to, right? We're all sort of we're sort of pinned in place, like like bugs in a mm-hmm. in a in a specimen case, okay. you know. And and he can kind of he can kind of kind of see around that. Okay. So that, that's kind of how he experiences this. So things are, are just a little bit out of joint, and he kind of touches on this. So it, it's this is sort of like this is an issue that's real easy to get confused when you read because there's a lot of he, he tries to moor it together and he tries to sort of tie it all together with with juxtaposition, but then every so often there'll just be a randomly inserted out of order, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, out of order panel. Like you'll have him, like he's like he says he can he says. It's 1966, and she's packing. It's 1963, and we're having an argument. It's 1959, and it's Christmas. It's all happening at the yeah, same time. Yeah, it's just all happening for him. So, you know, as we're going through these panels, um, like, you know, Scott was saying, like, this first page, you know, is, is going, like, it's just counting down backwards. Mm-hmm. Like I said, it's, you know, truly amazing. You know, he's um, walking through the sand, mm-hmm. and um, towards the end, of the, uh, end of the page, he just drops the, he drops, he eventually drops the, um, the picture he was looking at. And then that's when we start figuring out, you know, what is actually going on. And uh, what's actually like, like Scott Sanders, we're actually finding out what's going on um, with his own own origin in this chapter that's called Watchmaker. Yes. So and he and he's so he dro- he's sitting there and he drops the photograph. Then he stands up, then he gets up. So that's why there's footprints around the photograph. Right. You can see that he's sitting down looking at the photograph. He puts it down, he gets up and he walks forward. Right. So he's leaving behind this uh, the symbol of a memory, right? The symbol of this memory that he's looking at. But he doesn't need a photograph. Right. Because he is living that memory constantly because he's always living it. And it's also a good symbol, you know, um, symbolism of him um, letting go of what was tethering him to humanity. And mm-hmm. as uh, we were talking about before in previous chapters, um, he's learning how he's actually just realizing um, how to he's just realizing that he's not as human or he's becoming less human than what he, what he was when he initially began, you know, first um, when he first became like, you know, Dr. Manhattan during his incident. And mm-hmm. um, this chapter goes into that. Yes. So without further ado, let's talk about how we ended up with. 
the man who has been described <laughs> as uh, God exists, and he's an American, right? That's what they talk. That's how they talk about this guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that story begins in 1945 in Brooklyn. And uh, Johnny Osterman, which means Eastman, by the way, in German. All right. Uh, is <laughs> that's right? I took at least four years of German. <laughs> and that's all I know. Uh, so he's at uh, his, his kitchen table. He's waiting to go to school, and he's just practicing watchmaking, which is what his father does for a living. Uh huh. And his dad walks in and says, "Have you seen this? Have you seen this? It's the the atomic bomb is dropped on Hiroshima." And for John's dad, <clears throat> this signifies to him that his conception of the clockwork universe where everything fit together and slotted together and, you know, and time was an immutable constant right. to this man. Uh-huh. Um, that's the whole, the precisionness, and that's what, what he was. All of that is shattered by quantum theory because mm-hmm. there's so much uncertainty and because, you know, of how Einstein's relative, theory of relativity indicates that time is a relative thing, meaning that clocks can run at different speeds. If there's the same clock could run at different speed here and in space, or here in traveling at the speed of light or near the speed of light. Right. Um, and and f- that sort of shatters John's dad's worldview, and it makes him tell his son, like, I do not want you to be a, uh, a clockmaker like me. I want you to be a watchmaker. I want you to be a nuclear physicist. Right. And it changes um, his um, um, direction. And, and part of what, and Dr. Manhattan tells us this, part of what he's looking for is he's trying to give a name to the force that set everything in motion, right? Mm-hmm. Which, which um, uh, is uh, what we would call the uncaused cause in philosophy, mm-hmm. or the primal cause, or the primary cause. So mm-hmm. uh, this is like uh, if you would consider saying uh, that uh, you know the world is created, and we can tell that because the Big Bang, and that's the beginning of everything, right? That's right. when God put his finger in the, in the stuff, and then boom, everything happened. Right. Uh, so that's kind of what he's looking for. So he's searching for that. And what he's also searching for is what led him down the path to becoming this inhuman, you know, not a monster, but a, but a not human being. Right. Something post-human right. is what he is, you know, above humanity. And he's saying part of, so he's thinking first about his father. So he's in chronological, he's thinking, is this my dad pushing me into particle physics? Uh-huh. Right. Taking me out of what I would be doing if without, you know, and, and that that push toward particle physics led him to get, uh, you go to Princeton University and get a PhD, and that leads him to Gila Flats or Gila Fats. I don't know. I, I think it's Gila, right? You say it like that, right? Eh. Gila Flats. Um, I, I think it's Gila. Um, Gila. But you're, but you're probably right. Um, but, hashtag hate Sam. <laughs> and, uh, hashtag hate Sam. If you believe it is, that gets confusing, man. Look, I'm know, just right? gonna call it Gila Flats because I think that's right. And okay. if I'm wrong, I'm guessing someone from Arizona will send me a real hashtag nice hate Scott. Hashtag hate Scott for all your hate Scott needs. <laughs> and everyone's got him. All right. Uh, so ah, here he's we now, be, um, how Wally Weaver. Yes, Wally Weaver, the not so bright but very, very uh, congenial lab assistant that we see squiring a uh, new Dr. Osterman, uh, the new uh, physicist from Big Shot Princeton University, uh, who even saw Einstein lecture once. Mm-hmm. You know, a little bit of modesty. So Wally shows him around, Gila Flats. Uh, and um, Wally shows him the a chamber where they remove the intrinsic field from the objects, mm-hmm. and he says there's a lot of security and a lot of new safety features on this thing. Uh, foreboding, foreboding, foreboding. And uh, and then he says, "Oh, let me show you where the real thinking gets done." And he takes him over to the bar. Right. And this is where I was saying this pa- this panel here on page five of the issue. Where you see, uh, you can see Dr. Manhattan's, all these blue boxes, by the way, are Dr. Manhattan's sort of narration. Right. Uh, we've discussed in earlier episodes, there's not a lot of thought bubbles, right? But this is all, this is how we get them. <laughs> this is yeah, him telling and, us and, and also to make a point, too, um, when we're talking about um, narration and also just, um, you know, uh, captions outside of actual thought, I mean, uh, talk bubbles, this is the second one, because the first one we get is from Rorschach, you know, doing mm-hmm. his journal. So yes. this is pretty much the second time. This is the second character that we're seeing. We'll see if it continues with other characters, but mm. um, it's we're already in issue four, and we're just now getting another uh, character's point of view. And that and the media is in media. So Rorschach has a real physical journal he's writing in, right? This is a media that mm-hmm. exists, right? But this is a little different, yes. Because Doctor Manhattan is just kind of. It's almost like he's telepathically speaking to us, you know, almost. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I, I don't know. That's the way I'm thinking about it. I like to pretend I have some sort of powers. I don't know. That's just a weird comic book fan thing I do. 
Okay, so <laughs> you just might. <laughs> might you know? You Part know. of my powers are annoying people. If you've people seen glass, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, all right. <laughs> all right. So the next thing that's important here, he meets Jenny Slater. Uh-huh. Uh huh. J- uh, Jamie Slater is important. We remember her from the last chapter. She's got cancer now. Uh, is blaming Doctor Manhattan for that, and it's what, prompted what, his exile. Uh, um, just to back up, one thing I did notice here. Okay, so he's on Mars now, right? Yes. So when he's um, reminiscing, as I would say, you know, about mm-hmm. his past and everything, um, he's going into this bar. So what is where did this bar come from? Where all everything is um, all shot up and just not in place? That can't well, be on Mars, right? No, that's in. He went there. That's where he teleported himself after he left Rockefeller. He went to the bar in Arizona to get the picture. Oh, oh okay, okay, okay. So I, I'm sorry, guys. I'm, I'm, I read this thing multiple times. I didn't realize he went to Arizona first before he went to uh, Mars, right? Yeah, it's just in the last chapter. Gotcha, so it's easy gotcha, to, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so just scratch everything I said. <laughs> he didn't go to Mars first, guys. He went to um, Arizona. You know, he's from showing the, you how the, his. Right. And, yeah, and he's saying, like, I remember in the past being there in the future is what he says. Right? Hashtag hate Sam. I already know this coming. So here, 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 just just give it to me, people. Give it to I'm, me. I'm not here to do this. <laughs> but they are. <laughs> but they are. <laughs> They're going to give you the business. <laughs> they sure are, boy. I could take it, so, though. I'm a big boy. <laughs> so, uh, so. Then Janie actually says something that's actually pretty important for the plot of the story, right? Okay. This is important for, for John to remember, and that's that, I guess so, Hank died last fall some kind of tumor. Mm-hmm. So what this tells us, and, th- and this is something that's, that's a, a little detail, but what it tells us is that John's not really responsible for, for Janie's cancer. Right. Because whatever the carcinogen is involved with these experiments was present before him because mm-hmm. it killed this guy. Mm-hmm. So if, they're de- if she's a scientist who's dealing with dangerous radiation, it's not John's dangerous radiation, right? So mm, It's just dangerous yeah. radiation, period, because of exactly. what she's dealing with, you know? Exactly. But the media and um, what people's speculation was, because they know nothing really about um, Dr. Manhattan's um, whole sense of being and everything. They just know that he's uh, all of a sudden just a danger. And what they put together and decide that this is a theory that they want to come up with and mm-hmm. a sign of blame. Well, I guess if you want to talk about the media needs to make a story. So this is a story, and this is the simplest way they can say, you know, let's just blame Dr. Manhattan for the um, right. <laughs> for the cancer. Right. <laughs> yeah, so so that's uh, that's something I noticed here. Yeah, and Janie buys pickup. him a drink. Mm-hmm. She buys him a drink, and then he remembers, like, big moments in their relationship that we haven't seen yet in 1963 and 1966. And she seems so happy, too, boy. <laughs> she does. She's super happy. You know, she's just glad to be there. She says John's really young for a research scientist. She seems to, uh, and, you know, like him a great deal. Mm-hmm. So they go. he goes to visit friends at Princeton, and she comes with him because her mom's in New Jersey. And so they're f- as friends on this trip, right? Right. They're as friends on this trip. And uh, they get their picture taken, and it's the picture that he has gotten and taken to Mars. Okay. I love how so they, is... um, they, they use that single panel and mm-hmm. use this as a, um, as a way of framing. This is pretty much framing their story. This is how they got together, and this is showing the, how the, you know, they once loved each other. And, you know, um, he's pretty much just reminiscing on everything that was tethering to him. You know, that was, this, is, this was his humanity here as far as him and Janie. Yes. So he's, he's tethered to his humanity now. And uh, a fat man, <laughs> a fat man steps on his watch or her watch as it falls off. And then she, uh, he says, I can fix it. Mm-hmm. And then they do it uh, that night as they contemplate the broken watch. And he's reminded of more, uh, you know, more, uh, you know, memories of their future relationship. Yeah, he also so, goes back to, you know, when he um, when he was doing that with his father as far as building those watches, putting those together. So, no, yes, that too. Yes. So this is sort of like a residual, like, uh, it's like a residual uh, skill that he still he still has. Mm-hmm. It was pretty nifty there. Um, and so in August of 1959, um, so they're back, and he's like, oh, I fixed your watch. And she's she asked for the watch, right? Right. So he's like, oh, I left it in my lab coat. I left my lab coat in the experiment machine. Mm-hmm. So he runs back in, and the door shuts behind him. Okay, the intrinsic field experiment machine. Right. And, and he's laughing. He's like, oh, I'm so dumb. I got locked in here. Ha, ha, ha. And nobody else is laughing. 
because the door is locked and they can't unlock it and they can't turn off the experiment. And then the doctor tells him what he, well, we're gonna you know remove the intrinsic field from block concrete block fifteen. And John's then he, he says uh, John says they, then he told me what happened to the other fourteen blocks, <laughs> and then he freaks out. Yeah, of course no, he would. And and we're seeing it from um, John through these captions. But um, mm-hmm. if you notice how you know the story is being presented in these nine panels, we get the whole reaction too. Even if you don't, uh, if if you, if you take all these panels away, the story is still being told with the reactions, which is a brilliant thing about you know Dave Gibbons about how um, you know the look on their faces once they realize that he's locked up in there. You take away the panels, everything is still there. You know, as far mm-hmm. as like, you know, telling like the story and everything, they, they realize that they, he cannot get out the um, there's no way that they can unlock it. It's already, you know, set to a timer. So whatever is about to happen is about to happen. Yep. It's determined. So John has entered this this place. Right. Mm-hmm. And before before he entered it, mm-hmm. before he even came to heal, all of this was going to happen to him. And what's interesting is that be, even though, you know, his entire existence is a reaction against uh you know a non-deterministic and random universe Mm -hmm. he actually views things as deterministic Mm. which is how he's explaining this to us that he was always going to be in that machine right and that these things that happened had to happen and there's no way to change them or to have changed them whatever is going to happen will happen yes and then uh janie leaves so he's stuck and he doesn't want her to leave and she can't watch what's about to happen to him right so she fails him here and I think that that he doesn't ever really forget that or forgive it, ever. I think that the rest of their entire relationship is tinged with his resentment over that, for sure. Do we call it resentment or just like, okay, well, this is just another human, you know, because as he, as he starts to lose grip with his own humanity, you know, he um, maybe it starts out as resentment. Maybe you're right, you know. Um, but he begins not to maybe so much as forgive. Th- these are just feelings that just really are really no of no of no consequences, you know, at some point, you know, to him. What what's essentially interesting about what, what's interesting to me about it is that Janie, mm-hmm. what, what, you know, he eventually leaves Janie. We know that because he's with, you know, he's with Lori in the future. Right. Mm-hmm. So so he leaves Janie and it's almost like a poetic end to it's a poetic echo of how she leaves him. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he leaves. They leave each other here. And, you know. That, that's sort of, it's almost like, you know, almost like, a, I don't want to say a get even, because I don't think he's doing it maliciously, but mm-hmm. it sort of echoes that she, you know, once his fate was sealed, you know, she that, sort of moved that on. That was right pretty there. much the end, you know, just yeah. the end of their, their their whole thing. And he's just resigned, you know, this this this, this um, clock is just counting down. And, you know, he looks at the watch. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> he looks at, he really looks at the watch. And I mean, I don't know if it was on purpose or anything that would, you know, with the um, timer, you know, coming down, you know, going down. But he actually looks at a watch, you know, right. as if, to, um, you know, represent time um, in this in this situation that's about to just change his whole life. Yep. Yes, it is. And, um, you know, he's thinking about about Janie handing him the beer and he's uh-huh. wishing that he was having a, he was one, on one of those days, I guess. And then. The light takes him to pieces, mm-hmm. and there's an, a really a neat that panel there, that six panel, that six frame panel there, or that six panel frame. Uh, that's such a neat shot, right yeah, there. Yeah, great. Of him great. just what a great. Uh, that's a, that's one of the that's one of my all time favorite panels in any comic book. Actually, <laughs> I just want to stop and appreciate that for for a moment. Right, right. Of him right. just getting like nice. you know. Nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Sorry, that's just my <laughs> that's just something I like personally. Yeah. Uh, Okay. okay. <laughs> so they have a funeral for him, and he, they assume he's dead. Mm-hmm. And then in November, all of a sudden, eyeballs and a, and a, and a nervous system are show up in the bathroom. <laughs> and they're, they're just show up. And then November, he a circulatory system shows up. And then a couple days later, there's a skeleton standing there. <laughs> and then you see him with his, you know, the watch, the pocket watch, con- you know, components in 1945. And he's saying, you know, really, it's just a matter of putting yourself just back together. Putting yourself back together. And so they yes. put that, ca- they put that panel in there. They keep putting this same image. They know it's, mm-hmm. it's not like they have this image in different angles. With they could show him, um, um, and it, you know, with his face doing this. But they all uh, what more, what Moore and Gibbons does. They repeat, do, use a lot of these panels repeatedly to um, bring, sort of just to bring the point home of 
of constants of um a consistency of things just happening you know over and over again time really is relative i guess um yeah. and you know at this point he's he's doing the same thing um in a, in a different situation you know putting yes. himself back together he put watches together he's reassembling himself in this mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. he's reconstituting himself one one important bodily system at a time right and uh, as you might the you know when you actually get to design a mechanism for your own existence you don't you don't build it the same way it was the first time right you do a version 2.0 <laughs> and uh, john's version 2.0 is pretty good uh <laughs> he does a pretty okay job at putting something together here that i can get on board with uh you know he uh he shows up and uh he is the dr manhattan that we know the blue the, the, man the, the big blue butt naked Doctor yeah, Manhattan. butt naked blue zero percent body fat zero <laughs> shame no shame. zero shame <laughs> yeah neither shame nor body fat and then as you see on the next panel everybody mm-hmm. in the entire he's so powerful everybody in the entire cafeteria wants super saiyan so that was pretty uh, that's a dragon ball z joke that i guess sam has not seen that show <laughs> no some i don't of watch our dragon re- ball z <laughs> hashtag uh, so I think sam. Some, <laughs> some of our listenership may enjoy it i just i got a hunch uh, as, uh, some fans right. uh, <laughs> so that's 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 sort of the origin story right that's like mm-hmm. dr manhattan number one that's what you would see so if they had ever made uh, uh, you know a, in 19 you know 37 or 1960 if they'd made it a, uh, a dr manhattan comic book this is how it would start right this would be the first episode and this would be his you know uh origin story and then but but because the watchman universe isn't like uh an old-timey comic book right right so the next story we see about him is not a superhero story. It's him having a not so awesome Christmas <laughs> with, his, with his girlfriend, right? Yeah, adventure, you know. <laughs> yeah, a real adventure into into uh, you know. Uh, this, you know. The, the, in, in, in regular stories, you would um, have like, okay, he got his origin. You know, he got his powers and everything. So now we're going to see him, you know, display his powers. We're going to see him, you know, um, fight bad guys. We're going to see him do all the tropes that you would expect, you know, that could mm-hmm. come with an origin story. But here is called deconstruction, people. And mm-hmm. like Scott said, we go into a Christmas. <laughs> He's getting a Christmas gift, and it's a gold ring. Oh, wow. And he gets a gold ring from his girlfriend, and she uh-huh. says, do you like it? And I'm just going to quote him here because what he says is, like, so insane. He says, I like it very much. Its atomic structure is a perfect grid, like a checkerboard. It's And then Janie, he's like, Janie, what's up? Are you cold? <laughs> <laughs> I can raise She's the like, temperature. I'm terrified. <laughs> and, then she says, and then she says, I'm terrified. <laughs> I'm oh, scared. Oh, man. Oh, man. Just oh, imagine, man. folks, like I said, if your Lex was, was really alive, this is what it would be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, if right. Siri then, was really there, this is what it would be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, as soon as I said Siri, my things change. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, let's just let's let's just try to leave her out of this. She's a neutral, right? We don't uh, want to yeah. bring her in. Right, right, right. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, but this is important because you know his relationship with Janie is is uh, as we you know we've discussed is sort of a track for his connect tether to reality, right? To his tether to his humanity, and and she's afraid that he's slipping, right? And he says, "I'm the same person." I haven't changed. And then I'll read the last panel, his, his, his words here on the last panel here on this page. It's, I will always want you. And then he says, to, uh, I guess to us, as I lie, I hear her shouting at me in 1963, sobbing in 1966. My fingers open, the photograph is falling. So he's experiencing this all simultaneously. Amazing. And he, and he always has. Mm. So, you know, what do you do with a guy like this? I mean, what like seriously, is he use, what do you make use of him? And the government, you know, the United States government, in this universe is not one to you know look a gift horse in the mouth so to speak i I mean to Uh, me it's actually amazing because we thought that um that janie was just you know she was done with him right mm -hmm. you know here he is um they're back together and knowing everything that she knows about him or maybe doesn't know about him she still i guess finds it in her heart to to stay with him you know i think it's pretty pretty uh, up until whatever happened at this point in um, christmas 1959 you know she mm. she's just you know ultimately terrified and everything but she did decide to go back to him i mean they dated for like a month right like a month right. mm-hmm. and then this insane thing happened to him and all of a sudden he was the most powerful being on the planet mm-hmm. so you know it, it's it's definitely changed the dynamic of their relationship in a lot of ways uh right. <laughs> 
And you know, it's hard. It's hard to you know. He said when he started, "I'm looking for the proximal the, the proximal cause of all of this," and right. it's it's hard to know necessarily what he means by all of this because you know he could be referring to the entirety of the action we've seen in 1985, or he mm-hmm. could be talking about the impetus to you know start the universe. But uh, the, it seems to me that the proximal cause of his uh, of his you know new existence is you know that watch is fixing Janie's watch, right? Which sounds like a, a euphemism, but it's lit- literal. He was literally fixing her watch. <laughs> uh, next we see uh, February 1960, Dr. Manhattan in his new sweet outfit. It's a, it's a body leotard and a helmet, which Here. he essentially points out he does not need. <laughs> Here is the super suit, guys. You know, what Here every trope, you know, um, superhero needs. They do need a suit, you know. Um, mm. Unlike, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, going up in a police officer uniform or you know military uniform and everything superheroes have to have suits they have to have something that defines themselves and yes. dr manhattan immediately says this is not this is worthless why do i even need to put this on <laughs> he, says, he says what's this stupid symbol and they're like that's your symbol <laughs> and he's like this is dumb uh, that's your symbol dr manhattan sorry i need something that says, i can respect <laughs> He says, uh, well, it, I mean, it's like power. And he goes, that's meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> so he changes the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Niels Bohr model of the, uh, the hydrogen atom. Into an atom, So yeah. one, mm-hmm. one circular, a circle, uh, an electron circling a proton. The most simple basic form of matter that there is. The building block of everything. Immutable, constant, and ubiquitous. But here's what um, uh, one thing that we're seeing here: that we're slowly seeing how America, and I guess the 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 um, how they want to present their Superman. You know, mm-hmm. um, they want him to have a symbol. They want him to have something that people. He's he's kind of this media guy or whatever, or this um, official here. They want to um, have him be remembered. So they're so concerned about the way he looks. That um, it's 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 just a um a wondrous thing about how America in this in in this period of time is just changing and how they they're still stuck to their okay well we need to somehow market this right we need yeah. to somehow present this right to you know to to the world you know not only to Americans to the world you know this is mm-hmm. our guy this is um um you know our um American <laughs> what do we say about him Amer- uh, um. Him being um, of America. Oh, yeah. The Superman exists and he's American. Yep, exactly. Which is the quote from the old, uh, to, you know, the old uh, news anchor there on the next page. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Dr. Man- Dr. Manhattan, he didn't really know. They, uh, you see him getting his name down on the bottom left, right? Right. Dr. Manhattan, Dr. what? Like, he doesn't. <laughs> he just kind of lets him out. This whole page, I mean, if it was presented as a comedy routine or a I mean, comedy some serious scene shade. in, in, in a, yeah. he He's first, throwing some serious shade at the design. He's like, no, this he's, is terrible. He's, he's, he's like, first, he's like, okay, it's ridiculous and I'm wearing this costume. You you put a symbol on me that I don't like. That I don't even, you know, and then all of a sudden you're naming me. What? He doesn't, even, he doesn't just not like it. He's like, this is totally meaningless. <laughs> and now I'm Dr. What? <laughs> And then, like Scott said, he just lets it go. Okay, I, 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 at least I got my symbol on my head, you know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> wow. Uh, it's like, and then yeah. he says they're shaping me into something gaudy and lethal. Right. It's what he, and yeah. then they show the next page is a montage of his of some of his feats of strength, his telekinesis, his ability to melt a tank. Mm. And then they ask old Nelson, <laughs> ask old Nelson, uh, mm-hmm. Captain Metropolis. They ask him, "What do you think about?" It? He's like, "Well, we're very pleased." <laughs> I don't know what that's, uh, you know. Uh, and they say, and, and how they refer t- to the Minutemen? They say the uh, the costume vigilantes remaining from the '40s, mask hero fad. That's how they refer to them now. And to this point, um, um, the the Minutemen, they were already, you know, in in um, functioning and everything, and doing their costume adventuring. So this is the first time that you know he's presented out in the world, and all of a sudden, mm-hmm. it's making the costume adventurers obsolete. Yep. yep. <laughs> They're, what are they going to do? You know? well, yeah, what are they going to do? You know, and we, and we see this because, you know, they don't like the American government doesn't just want him to be a, a you know, a specter of nuclear, you know, annihilation for the Soviets. They want him to actually they actually want him to go and do some crime fighting. Right. So that they can kind of, you know, uh, they can kind of like, you know, say, oh, look, that's what he's doing. You know, he's, yeah, he's yeah, carrying they're, on this they're, tradition of the guys. They're, they're getting um, uh, their sense of propaganda going on as far as him. Yes. 
So in, in June 1960, he goes to what is essentially a Red Cross mm-hmm. charity thing with the guys, the surviving Minutemen. And uh, there, there's one other second or silver generation, uh, silver era superhero. It's Ozzy Mandius is there. Oh, you may want to back up here. Look at that last Ooh. panel on page 13. Yes. Or actually, the, just read the last two. Um, Janie's talking to him. She seems to be, you know, real cool with everything. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, I guess it's just showing that they're, she's getting pretty used to, you know, the idea of him and everything. Um, so she's just talking about next time, um, you know, next photo session. Uh, everybody's talking about your fashion. Uh, it's a fashion significance and everything. So he's becoming like a fashion signal and everything. And the, mm-hmm. and, and the whole thing about that is... He's a he's arrived. She tells him he's arrived, and he's like, "Have I?" Sometimes I feel like I've been here the whole time, <laughs> the entire time, you know. So that goes back into what Scott was saying about he's experiencing um, time in a in in simultaneous, you know, simultaneously. But mm-hmm. he's he at this point he's has that feeling. So yes. maybe he hasn't realized his, the the whole ram uh, the whole complexity of his. His, his powers or his um, abilities and everything, but he already in this panel has that feeling. Mm-hmm. He's just, he's world weary, and it's almost as if he's looking back at 1960 from 1985, but it's mm-hmm. just 1960. Exactly. So he's looking back on himself, but he's also able to, like, it's almost as if he, I don't know, it's so weird, it's almost like he can, like, move move in memory, you know? Like, he can go back into memories and reshape things. It's just so, right. uh, so crazy. Um, and so, you know, we see this, and I want to comment a bit here. So, so uh-huh. how Dr. Manhattan talks to Ozzy Mandy is here and says he's the only interesting one <laughs> of all these crime fighters. He says that guy is the one that's interesting. Yeah, we don't really know a lot about Ozzy Mandy as yet in the story. Uh, just that he's, you know, he's younger. He's younger than the other crime fighters. He's present at the other meeting, and he's mm-hmm. a, a rich person in 85. So mm-hmm. we know about him. Um, and then uh, he's told, essentially, the Pentagon tells him. Uh, you had better um, go fight some crime. And so he says, okay. And we run into this, this situation where he's essentially um, way, way, way overpowered in comparison to his competition here, right? Right. I mean, you see him just point and blow some dude's head off, like just <laughs> pointing. And then everyone starts screaming in terror. And, you know, do you ever think about how, like, sometimes they'll have Superman stop a bank robbery? Right. And then you like you think about that's a little bit beneath him, right? You know, like you know he's punching, he's pun- he takes the time to like punch one dude with a gun and then turn around and punch another dude, right? When he could just have melted those those guns from as soon as he walked in, right? Uh-huh. Like he could have just blown mm-hmm. through these people. Mm-hmm. Um, and Doctor Manhattan doesn't seem willing to mod to pull his punches and modulate himself to make a you know to make a nice face uh, for everybody. And he says, the morality of my activities escapes me. He doesn't understand what he's doing. Yeah, he, he's pretty much, uh, I, I guess when Jerry Siegel and Joel Schuster first um, developed Superman, um, and, you know, they had him just stop and robbery. They wasn't so much as big villains, big super villains that they dealt mm-hmm. with. It was just common, you know, um, stuff, you know. He right. was a Superman, and he was able to leap tall buildings in single bound. Um, at that point, he wasn't able to fly yet, but, right. you know, he was the most powerful man in the world. So, mm-hmm. you know, you would expect him to really hurt people or really, uh, I, I, maybe not even pull his punches, but I guess what we're seeing in this panel is that this Superman here and this this super being in real in this reality, you know, is not pulling any punches. You no. know, he, he doesn't feel the need to. He doesn't feel the need to. But, you know, he's still taking directions from the government. And this is mm-hmm. the um the weapon that they let loose <laughs> on it, civilians, it? Right? by the way. Well, know. not nice ones. At not least. nice I mean, ones. At, you know. at least Moloch was, in fact, like we find out here, confirmation that he was, in fact, a bad dude. Nah, you know. <laughs> right. I mean, at least they're. There's something to this, that, right? I guess this this is um Doctor Manhattan's Batman tendencies, guys. <laughs> yes, his Batman tendencies. Uh, he's su- he was super intelligent. That's Batman tendency number one, and he is not bothered by extreme violence on people he's just met. That's Batman <laughs> tendency number two. <laughs> Everyone's got a little bit. Uh, so then we see him. He meets JFK, and mm-hmm. he knows JFK is going to get assassinated, but he doesn't do anything to stop it. Right. 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 I mean, we know here he says he says two years later in mm-hmm. Dallas. Right. So he mm-hmm. knows it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And then we've seen this uh, this great scene with Hollis Mason that we saw echoed in uh, what we just read under the hood. Chapter five. Right. He talks about the end of his career and how Dr. Manhattan made him think he would survive. 
and they give him a civic banquet, and he says, you know what, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go make car, I'm gonna fix cars, uh, Dr. Manhattan, and then Dr. Manhattan says, well, the new electric car should be very simple. And then he's like, what? And he's like, oh, the polyethylene batteries were not capable, were not available until I can produce enough lithium to mass produce polyethylene batteries. Of course, I can synthesize it easily. Anyway, it's been interesting meeting you again. I hope you enjoy your retirement. He's and like, what he's huh? saying there is, yeah, he's like, you're not going to have a retirement because you're not going to need to fix any cars because they're going to be a lot easier to maintain and do and mm-hmm. run. So right. he's, he didn't just, and what's interesting about this is that he didn't just bounce Hollis from his day job and his night job. Mm-hmm. He bounced it from his retirement job. He bounced <laughs> everything. He bounced Hollis out all the way out. All the way out. All yeah. the way out. Also, Hollis, I feel like Hollis Mason is Charlton Heston. I'm just going to say. <laughs> I feel like that's how they drew him. That's okay. It was 85 before mm-hmm. any crazy stuff happened. <laughs> so so then we talk, We find out what the fight was about in 63, right? Right. And it was because he didn't stop the JFK assassination. And you're thinking to yourself, why? He says, I can't prevent the future to me. It's already happening. So he doesn't have a way to alter it, but his actions now will impact the future later, and he can mm-hmm. see that. So he can't move outside of that system. He almost he exists inside. Of, you know, he's not he's not bound by the same limitations as us, but he still is extant in the closed system that we're in. Right. So he can't get outside of the system and change it and alter the timeline. Right. So he can't divert the time stream, but he can see the entirety of it. He 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 knows everything, and um, this is an argument that him and Janie you know get into, um, especially about them. Because, you know, she goes in um, to talking about, well, you do, you know, about everything, you know, you know about, you know, how we're going to end up, you know, what about us? And he goes into such a cold, you know, a way of looking just at everything, you know, um, as as far as an answer to her and just the way that she reacts. She just realizes that this is um, (laughs) it's just it's just amazing how she reacts to, you know, (coughs) excuse me. Mm-hmm. It's amazing how she reacts to, you know, his coldness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. And and she says, I'm not a puppet. And then uh, she says that in that. That's it. She says, I'm a, is that what you think? I'm a puppet? And he says, no, we make love right after Wally arrives with the earrings I ordered for you. <laughs> and she, you know what I mean? Like, that's just such a cold thing to say. Right, right, right. It's like, now nah, we're going to, that's it. It's going to be fine in about 10 minutes. Like, don't worry <laughs> about it. It's so, it's so condescending. Uh, but yet and still she reacts. She, even hearing everything that comes out of his mouth, she still reacts how mm-hmm. he expected to her or how he knows that she's going to react. Yes. Even though she said it, I mean, even though she hears it and everything. Now, it, it it just brings up this okay because if 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 she hears everything she's saying and he know and she knows that you know something is about to happen, would would you think that she would have a way to change it? No, that's not how it works. Everything that's going to happen is going to happen. And his knowledge of those events is taken into account in his actions, which causes the events. Oh man! So that's, he can't. That's I, that's a lot to wrap my mind around, Scott. I don't know about yeah. you guys. <laughs> All right. So because he knows what's going to happen. His actions cause the future to happen. Mm. And so it's all, mm. you know, it's all a big knot of causality. And mm. it's one of the interesting, it's almost like a time travel novel, but not quite. It's not quite time travel, it's time experience. So he still does it in one, you know, one it's, lifetime. It's, if, if you guys ever watch Lost, um, that's something, that's another uh, Damon Lindelof show who is mm-hmm. going to be the showrunner of this Watchmen. So that's what I'm looking forward to when this show comes out is that he brings a lot of those lost elements into, um, you know, the Watchmen because the loss um, actually gets a lot of its influence from Watchmen, um, mm-hmm. from from the story structure and everything, talking about time and the way time works and, you know, how um, it, whatever happened has happened and how string theory and everything, you know, um, it, 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 it's, a, it's it, for for those of you guys who actually watched the show and liked it and liked it and didn't wasn't <laughs> really disappointed in like the ending and everything. This is where. You know, um, Lindelof got a lot of his material from, as far as like inspiration and everything. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, he, I, I didn't really watch Lost as much as you. I only saw the last season, so for mm-hmm. me, it's a little. You know, I watched all the recaps and stuff, and I got into the zeitgeist at the end. But when it was real big and real mysterious, I was sort of like, I don't know what I was doing. What? What? When was that? Was that like twenty years ago? Ten years ago? Mm-hmm. That was about like ten years ago, maybe ten, yeah. eleven years ago. I know. I'm I know one being... thing. If you ever I, and, and and I do, uh, since you haven't really seen it, um, yeah. at some point in your life, I think you should sit down and actually just watch that show and just appreciate it. Because, like I said, um, if if 
it, it would be it would be the same way as how I felt on when Watchmen came out. Mm-hmm. And the zeitgeist was at a point where, okay, you need to really uh, read this book. You read this book, read this book. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, just hemming and hawing and everything. Finally, I got around to reading the book and found out how brilliant it was. You know, mm-hmm. um, it came out in 85. I don't think I actually touched it until like 89, 90. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, yeah. Anyway, okay. so we we were now at the point of seeing um, um, Manhattan's perspective at the Minutemen meeting. Yes, the Crime Busters meeting in sixty. I mean, the, the Crime Busters one. meeting. Crime Busters meeting. I'm calling the Minutemen. only one, and everybody's just getting there, and he is noticing Lori, and he is big time noticing her, and he is realizing this is the lady from eighty five. I guess that's kind of the way he says it. It's like, oh, I just met my girlfriend. It's kind of the way, you know what I mean? Right. It's right. kind of the way he's looking at it. And so he's staring at her, and Janie notices it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she's like, she's like, I want to leave. I don't like this. And then, uh, you know, Nelson's like, please don't all go. I don't know why I think he has a high voice all of a sudden. Uh, <laughs> Janie accuses him of, uh, of uh, chasing jailbait and says that it's because she's getting older and he's not. And he says... She's aging more noticeably every day, and he's standing still, and we see him on Mars at the end of that. Oh, punctuation. This third panel here is in the same position as um, what we see when, when she's tu- where he's touching Lori. It's in mm-hmm. the same position that he was touching um, Janie back in um, panel ele- uh, or page 11. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> uh, at it, the, is. Mm-hmm. it is. It yep, is. It's yep, exactly yep. the same. Oh, my yep. goodness. I don't, I don't know That's how um, they do that. So you That's know, a good they, they, it's, it's a Dense people, dense. Anyway. Man. <laughs> it's almost like they thought it all out. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so we see then... <clears throat> sorry. Uh, so then we see two things happening simultaneously. Uh, we see Dr. Manhattan going on patrol with, uh, with Lori, and we see him breaking up with Janie. And one is the cause of the other, but we see them displayed side by side simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Super, which is a super, you know, artistic way of doing that. Right. Uh, super neat. So she leaves him, and uh, a, a comment here. Um, mm-hmm. Okay, so I guess one thing, um, uh, just you know, continuously, you know, going back over Watchmen, is 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 Doctor Manhattan's humanity and his needs. <laughs> yep. Um. Does he feel that he has to to have the need to have a relationship with a um um a woman, you no, know, or just relationship period? Because you know he leaves Janie, mm-hmm. you know, and ends up with Lori, right. you know. Um, you would think after Janie, he's just like, okay, well, you know, I don't really need a relationship, so why am I still in? And but yet and still, he he cheats on her with Lori. So right, why why in, in your in in your opinion, or maybe even stated fact in this. Um, why do you think he does that? I think that what this is a commentary on what the cause of his the end of his relationship with Janie is, uh-huh. and that it's it's supposed. I think you can suppose that it's the end of it's his humanity ebbing, but it's not it's not the elimination of his humanity because we see that, that he does yet. right. Yes, we see he does still have needs, okay. and we see that he does still you know want sex right it's yes. something that he wants right. so his lack of connection with her and his lack of attraction to her isn't so much. Uh, his withdrawal from mm-hmm. humanity because mm-hmm. it's coupled together with his interest in, in Lori, hmm. and and that's what makes his leaving. That's what sets apart his end of, at the end of his relationship with Janie uh-huh. and the end of his relationship with Lori. Uh-huh. Is that at the end of his relationship with Lori, he is not leaving her for a, a younger, newer model. He's leaving her for a, a cold rocky dead planet <laughs> because he he wants to go that's what he leaves her for he doesn't leave her to go shack up with some you know some teenager he leaves her to you know go to mars i mean there's nothing that's, there's rocks. that's a heck of a progression there boy <laughs> i mean so he is so he's not so he's withdrawing from Janie here but he's withdrawing into Lori. he's withdrawing into something mm-hmm. that is more more uh, attractive in his opinion mm-hmm. and he's still doing that in uh, at the end of uh, in 85 except what's more attractive to him is not another human being it's something uh you know it's mars right which is a crazy thing to be attracted to you know mars is a planet it's not a something that can return your affection not at all, but you know it's definitely something that he's. Um, 
I don't want to say attracted to, but drawn to, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're back on in May 66 where him and Lori are, you know, going out on patrol and um, it's juxtaposed with <laughs> Janie yeah. just getting just just a shaft period. You know, it's, she's, it's and she, she's just like, you're you're such a man. You know, even though you're not a human anymore, <laughs> you're, right. you're, you're just you're you're a pig. You know, a pig. you know, just a, um, you're you're just such a man, um, um, that you're just cheating on me with this young, hot, you know, um, um, you know, version and everything. You know, you know her sagging boobs and her wrinkles and everything, and you know stuff that he notices, but I don't know if he really cares. But um, he's still he still. He still goes on to um, have his relationship with Lori. And then, you know, you see that bottom panel there where she's mm-hmm. packing up and she's putting the suitcase. And they've been alluding to this through the whole chapter. Okay. And he's been talking about in 59, she's handing me the drink. In 63, we're having this fight. In 66, she's leaving. And this is her leaving in 66. Mm. So he's experiencing her their whole relationship simultaneously. Mm-hmm. And then his dad dies. And he doesn't really, he never tells them that, we find out he never told his dad that he was alive. Or Dr. Manhattan. Mm. So his dad never knew. His dad mm. thought he died in that experiment. Mm. So wonder why that is. Probably because he didn't like him messing with his watches. I guess. <laughs> okay. Pushing him forward into this, you know, he kind of blamed him a little. Uh, then Hila Flats closes down, and in '71, Nixon asks him to go to uh, Vietnam to solve a problem for the country, which uh, Kennedy wouldn't do in Cuba. And he remarks on the difference between the huh. two men. Right. Mm-hmm. So Nixon sends him back. So Nixon sends him to Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And he gets there in March, and he uh, meets the comedian, and he he finds the com- comedian very interesting because he knows that he's amoral on purpose. He knows that everything's crazy, but he doesn't care. Right. So he knows everything's going to hell. He doesn't care at all. He's different. He understands perfectly. He doesn't care. And then we are treated to the answer to the question we probably were asking. You know, I'm sure. Well, I'm sure Holly's asking herself, which is, how do we win the Vietnam War? Right, that's I'm still I'm sure I'm curious, uh, and then uh, we see a uh, like a thousand foot tall Doctor Manhattan <laughs> stride and stride the, the countryside the, the, just to, and they're just running all amok, you know the, um, the soldiers on the ground and everything. The enemy is just fleeing. <laughs> right, in two months he wins the entire war, and the and the Viet Cong, you know, demand to surrender to him in a sense of religious awe is what he says. So right. so neat, uh, and then he does not. He says I didn't help. I didn't stop the comedian. And he's also experiencing being on Mars in 85. And he says, I no longer wish to look at dead things, which is uh, also he's he's talking about the stars, too. He says we're looking at old photographs of the stars earlier. Mm-hmm. We're not looking at them them as they are presently. And uh, then 75 comes and, you know, Nixon extends his stay in the White House. And Ozymandias uh, goes public as Adrian Veet. And um, we are treated to a scene of Lori and John uh, in his even skimpier Dr. Manhattan costume in Antarctica mm-hmm. with Bubastis. Right, right. His lynx, who is a rather expensive feed, as he <laughs> says. Uh, so Ozymandias has, uh, has uh, Dr. Manhattan down to his, his place, his secret uh, place called Karnak on the, uh, uh-huh. on the South Pole. And then they muse about how Dr. Manhattan has created a world where scientific progress has leapt forward since he showed up. Right. And, you know, they say we'll only be limited by our imaginations, and uh, Dr. Manhattan says, and, and by their consciousness, surely, and all Ozymandias, the smartest man in the world, can say to him is, I, uh, let's hope so. Not real promising. Yeah. Man, <laughs> even though, you know, they, they always have... Um uh, uh, a way of progress will constant pushing, pushing, pushing. They can't stop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and that's a commentary that this um this graphic novel poses too. You know, um, they discover things but can't stop themselves. It's like they just can't help themselves. Right. And uh, and then we're treated to um, another montage of him experiencing simultaneously the the Keen Act riots in Washington D.C. where. Uh, they were going to all the police in the whole country quit, and they were going to make uh, everyone been on a huge riot. And he says, "Pay attention, you will all return to your homes." And someone says, "Oh yeah, what if we don't want to?" And then he says, "You misunderstood me. That was not a request." And he teleports every single person home. 
<laughs> and and um, Lori's like, Jesus. <laughs> and they're just gone. So there's this riot. It's red, right? Blood, red, right. anger, hate. Mm. They're all at the White House. And then the next, the next panel, it's just quiet. Right. And all their signs are just laying around. He says two people had heart attacks, but he's pretty sure more people than that would have died if it would have gone for it. Mm. Oh, yeah. So he's making his judgment there. That's Superman in effect, you guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is how Superman would be if he was real, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. He'd be, yeah, he'd be a scary, scary, scary thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Terrifying. Yeah. He not, could do not, anything Not he smiling and friendly and everything. The world <laughs> would bow down and, you know, it would all of a sudden just realize that, okay, it's something different going on here. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> it would be a lot more religion, um, I guess, in this point. People worship uh, like people worship Charles Manson for a while, like you yeah. know what I mean. Like people mm -hmm. that actually can't perform miracles get worshipped. So right. you can imagine what it would be like if you could. I mean, and literally, literally here, turn water into wine. He can do that. I mean, he could do that, right? Yep, he could because yep. he can manipulate the molecular structure. Yep. Uh, so I'm gonna imagine he would have several adherents, perhaps. <laughs> uh, so he is on Mars now, and he's you know talking about the Keen Act and how the Keen Act uh, made vigilantism illegal. And that was uh, that was something where vigilantes had been made legal previously to accommodate for Doctor Manhattan. Right. So that's what sort of we find that's what allowed the second generation of crime fighters to sort of spawn is that they were made they were legitimized by the government. Mm -hmm. um, they were uh, then uh, only he and Eddie Blake are left, and Eddie Blake solves the Iran hostage crisis essentially immediately, probably in a very violent uh, way. Uh, we see the hostages look a little bit terrified. Do you see them there like, getting off? They yeah, look all look yeah. <laughs> very sickened and terrified by what the comedian has done. The comedian, of course, looks triumphant in his mask, which hides his oh, uh, shame scar know. from Vietnam. Right, right, right. <laughs> we find out Lori and Dan both decided to uh, retire, although Dan stays in the, the shadows, decides not to go public. And Rorschach delivers the body of a multiple rapist with a note that says never. That's his answer. <laughs> That's his answer to the um the um the um the Keenet guys. You're not gonna stop him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you nope. can't. Never. Won't, can't stop, won't stop. <laughs> killing the killing the evil. Never uh, compromise. <laughs> <laughs> never nope, not even nope. I mean, what about an apocalypse, Rorschach? No, I would no, never know. Not at all. Uh-uh. Mm -mm. No. -uh. <laughs> no. Got to got to stick with the mission there, you know. Right. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, we find that uh, you know he's he's interested. He's sort of uh, treating Mars like a sandbox here. Mm -hmm. uh, he says things are so different. You know, you can smell ozone instead of diesel fumes. And he's experiencing that kid at you know he, he experiences all these things happening simultaneously. Uh, all of this time, these moments of time almost frozen, mm -hmm. like the watch the watch from uh, Hiroshima and touching Janie and at the amusement park and, you know, walking through Grand Central Station and all of that. Right. Yep. And him touching hands with the uh, um, with Janie, you know, right. holding a beer and everything. You know? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. He goes to it, like the um, um, the funeral, you know, he's experiencing that and he's getting um informed about um eddie blake's murder mm -hmm. you know <laughs> absolutely and uh, basically going back through everything here yep it's just like a little summary he says all this stuff happened and i'm out of there and then he is going to begin to build his a glass clock he's building a he's building an enormous imaginary clock out of glass from the sand of mars mm -hmm. and it's humongous mm -hmm. and he says who makes the world and who makes the world is the watchmaker uh, you know that's uh, that's what he says, and then he, then he gets up on his big old clock and he watches the meteorites as they come down. Mm -hmm. And then the last quote we get here is from Albert Einstein. You know, yes. Um, the release of the atom, the release of atom power has changed everything except our way of thinking. The solution to this problem lies in the heart of mankind. If only I had known, I should have become a watchmaker. <laughs> yep and that is how that's how the, the story part ends we are treated to a three uh, a three page summation afterwards of the powers and the superpowers and their superpowers written by uh, Professor Glass who ran the Gila Flats lab with uh, mm -hmm. with the John worked at and essentially uh, what it, and it's worth reading for sure what it effectively it says is that Dr. Manhattan is, is becoming distant from society and that what his presence has done is sort of muscularized uh, you know, United States foreign policy, which has led to more conflict than less conflict. 
So it's worse uh, than it would be without him because America's emboldened and it's caused more friction points with the Soviet Union, who well, is I mean, terrified it, and is existentially threatened. Well, exactly. So um, it, it brings a point to, OK, so they talk about, OK, if the Superman exists, you know, he's an American. So imagine that what that would be like for other nations that don't mm-hmm. have their own Superman, you know escalation would happen so it wouldn't be submission it would be escalation we got to find and do something to um you know if if americans if america kind of uh, attacks us with this guy you know we right. got to protect it's, it's a sense of survival you know we got to protect ourselves we got to do something you know so yep. the, the, the 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 nuclear stuff is it's just at its point, you know, uh, this and the book was written around when the Cold War was really at its height and all yep. the fears that um, happened um, mm-hmm. that were happening right around the Cold War. And this was like the biggest thing about nukes, you know, yep. so America has its, its, its own Superman. How would that how would that really how would the reaction of that be if he was to come out and say that um, I'm not a citizen of the U.S. or America, I'm a citizen mm-hmm. of the world. You know, yeah. how would that position um, 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 just go against um, everyone and maybe um, everybody, everybody in the world would be against him? I don't know. But it wouldn't be he's representing a whole country. You yeah. know, he actually would just be representing the world. Then no one can say, that. OK, well, he's ours. He's this. He's that, you know. Um, and that's what this particular chapter is going into as far uh-huh. as um, his powers and his superpowers. And I think that it would be one thing if what he was doing was Peace Corps stuff, right? Like if he was going mm-hmm. and, you know, uh, you know, helping out different countries and building schools and things like that. But he's not. He's with the United States military in Vietnam. Like he mm-hmm. is in – he has every inch of that, you know, um, worldwide real politic Nixonian muscular foreign policy. He is propping all of that up. And so you're right. It would be terrifying to deal with that. It, there's no – you know what I mean? There isn't anything you can do about it. You don't a, have an answer for it because there can't be an answer. Right. It's amazing how um, Amer- uh, Americans at that point, you know, Nixon was already on his third term. Is that what this this basically said? He's already on his third term? In 85, he would have been on his fifth, I think, right? Cause 68, 72, 76, 80, 84. So, yeah, he would have been, been on his fifth term in 85 and... Yeah, yeah, they they just basically just keep reelecting this guy. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's because it's they no, didn't he didn't get caught for for a lot of stuff. You know, there was a lot of stuff that was a little bit different yeah, <laughs> in this yeah, timeline. Yeah, yeah, no Watergate. Yeah. You know, he he won the Vietnam War. He didn't. You know what I mean? That was a big a big deal. He became super popular because of that. So, but and tricky. all of that was on Doctor Manhattan's back. Yeah, yeah, and pretty much the um, Americans, the the American government, pretty much made him their their lap dog you know their yep. um their their dog to go out into the world and you know just just strike fear <laughs> into everyone yep. that um we got the um superpower so it, uh, the 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 novel really goes into um what what powers the governmental powers are and how they you you would really think it should be a peace type of thing okay you know you could use this guy for peace but no they chose to use this guy for escalation of war yep. you know um not something to you know bring peace to the world and you know they use the um the knowledge of his existence and his um you know science um scientific achievements that they mm-hmm. that they've discovered and everything not to just you know um you know they, they they've done stuff to like you know maybe uh escalate different different technologies and different things throughout you know society and everything but their main thing was to keep pushing 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 and like scott has alluded to you know it's gotten to a point where everybody's just afraid they they just they're just waiting until this doomsday clock hits 12 yep yep i mean the 80s were scary like you said the 80s were scary enough as they were i mean you know what i mean like i remember doing you know bomb mm-hmm. drills in school even like and i feel like i'm way too young to you know i was in the 50s right like i said uh it's hard to forget that existential dread like the sort of damocles fe- feeling that was just permeated all of culture everything at that Every, time. everything and, and imagine uh, just being an adult around that time i mean we were kids and yeah. you know it was just something that was commonplace but i mean now looking back on it uh i could have that's that's crazy that you know that um that um you know our parents had to go through all that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and that's on the heels of you know when you think about it, 1985's relationship to uh, to 1945 is the same as our relationship to the 1979. Right. 
That's right. not. That doesn't feel like a super duper long time ago, right? Mm-hmm. It just feels like it. I mean, it still feels like. I mean, the Pirates last won the World Series in '79, right? Mm-hmm. I'm a Pirates fan, guys. I, I root for the Pittsburgh Pirates uh, baseball <laughs> teams. Uh, just a heads up. That's why. That's how I timestamp things. <laughs> Don't ask me about '92, please. Don't want to talk <laughs> about 1992. Yeah, yeah this is a um, pretty deep chapter here. You know, it talks about like um, that option is mutually uh, sure destruction. Simply stated, Doctor Manhattan cannot stop all the Soviet warheads from reaching American soil. Even a, um, a greatly reduced percentage would still be more than enough to effectively end all organic life in the northern, you know, northern hemisphere. So this mm-hmm. guy, <laughs> uh, it, it, it says, a suggestion that the presence of a superhuman what has inclined the world more towards peace, as I was talking about, you know, is repudiated by the um, sharp increase in both Russian and American nuclear stockpiles since the advent of Doctor Manhattan. So yep. basically, you know, Alan Moore is just saying that okay. You know, you through the comic book medium, guys, um, through the the and, and, and like I said, and, and I'll just keep just harping on it. This was a different comic book than your Superman, your Batman, your Spider-Man. You know, it really bought it brought it really deconstructed uh, what the um, what what heroes are, you know, inside books and how the reality would be if they actually existed. Yes. And this is what it would be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Or a version of what it might be. We don't know. We can't say exactly what it would be. But this is this is what he figures would be a reaction to, you know, the um, the Superman. And, and what's so interesting is we spend these issues, you know, thinking about they tell you how about how America's foreign policy is propped up by Doctor Manhattan and how we won the Vietnam War and all these amazing things. And then at the very end, we find out like he can't save us. Like Doctor Manhattan can't save us. Like you're waiting on this guy. So like, think about that for a second. Like we did. Like Nixon is really counting on the Soviets to not think Doctor Manhattan can can, you know, to think Doctor Manhattan can knock every single missile out of the sky. Well, the, what do they do? They just make more, right? Right. And right, we already right. know. For Doctor Glass has already studied his capabilities and said he ain't, he can't get them all. Yep. I don't think he can get them all. Not at all. And what he can't get is going to wipe out life, so he might as well not even exist. The only effect he'll have because he can't affect the end is to affect the cause. And and that's that's made it much more likely that something awful like this would happen. Right, right. And um, we <laughs> we we we're um slowly just discovering how and, and and what Scott and me were talking about from the begin very beginning. Each as each issue is escalating. It's just escalation. Mm-hmm. You know, we're at the point of you know Doctor Manhattan's origin and just realizing the magnitude of his existence and how it affects. Uh, affected um, in uh, the alternate reality of um, you know American and the world um, back then in 1985. Yes, exactly. It affected religion. It affected um, faith. It affected um, the way fashion the world fashion. Fashion <laughs> can't forget about fashion. He's a fashion there. icon. <laughs> and then at the end of this particular chapter, say we are living. Uh, we are all. We. are we are all of us living in the shadow of Manhattan. Yes. Wonderful. All right, so that's where we ended, guys. And, of course, the, the, the final page is the blood just slowly even more descending upon the clock. Yes. Doomsday is coming, guys. And if you compare... Uh you know, if you compare what the clock looks like here at the end of Chapter 4 with what the clock... You can see what's... Ha- you can see there's a, a general... You know, it's like the next frame in a flip book, so to speak. Yeah, time is moving. So, yes, man, that was a um, that was a really good chapter, guy. <laughs> it really was, dude. What a great, what a great book. You know, this is one of those, this is one of those chapters that really makes you appreciate the the craftsmanship that made you know, that went into building this thing. It's 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 really like like we spend all this this talking about a watchmaker and we talk mm-hmm. about the design and we watch you know Doctor Manhattan make his own enormous clock right out of right, you right. know the the sands of Mars and it's mm-hmm. it just reminds you what a what an excellently intricate piece of equipment this 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 comic book is it's wonderful well the whole chapter this particular one um t- you know talking about time and a clock we we see the disassembling of panels and we see the disassembling and putting really back together pieces mm-hmm. of, of a story you know um right. when you look at a watch well as as far as in this book you know the watch is all broken apart and everything this story this particular chapter here is presented in it's not linear you know it's 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 all it's all um broken apart but mm-hmm. when you really um put it all together it really just makes sense 
Um, it may not, and, and if you guys are just reading this from the, um, you know, as a, a start or um, as new to, you know, Watchmen, really going back through it again, you may need to just read the reread this chapter about a couple, maybe two or three times, just mm-hmm. to actually get it. Like um, I was telling Scott in the beginning, that um, ten second thing countdown from that uh, first page, I just now got that. That's crazy. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, th- this entire chapter, it's 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 it, one way to look at it is that like what he's doing here, you know, we see the disassembled pieces and we and that's, a you know, obviously a symbol here, mm-hmm. a metaphor. And, and what he is doing is reconstructing his memories of his life and trying yes, to put them into yes, chronological order yes. for you, the audience, because he doesn't think of them that way. So he's has to keep being like, like, OK, this is what happened in 1959, but also happened in 63 and 66 so all mm-hmm. these memories are sort of mm-hmm. located in the same place for him and he just experiences them all simultaneously like he mm-hmm. almost like he's hearing two audio tracks playing at the same time right right and he's it putting really them all neat. together for us you know? and that is <laughs> that's what they call going the extra mile to tell an interesting tale that's what they call that and we're only on chapter four. <laughs> oh my goodness! There's so much more to this. We and think about it. Like there's so much more media. We haven't even like heard anything about the show that's ba- that this is all based on. That's how much we like this. Uh, like, we're yeah, willing yeah, to put yeah, this yeah, sort yeah. of time in for a probable HBO show because we know the source material warrants it. Hey, I, if, if the show is not any good, I just enjoy doing this anyway. So. Um, hey, so yeah, I'm glad I got it. And, hey, if anyone ever wants to know what I thought about this, I mean, I can just be like, "Do you listen to my podcast?" And if they say no, I can be like, "Join the club of everybody else in the world." <laughs> and speaking of which, guys, if you want to um, send us feedback again at um, Watching Watchmen at NerdCyclopedia.com, follow us on Twitter at mm-hmm. Watchmen Pod, uh, please Watch Podcast. Watchmen podcast. Watchmen podcast one. One. There's no T. There's no a one tea. instead of a T. Right. And then um, you can also follow us on our regular Twitter. Um, you know, at Nerdcyclopedia. You can um, mm-hmm. um, also um, check out our YouTube page. I mean, YouTube um, channel at Nerdcyclopedia as well. Sam and Scott are mm-hmm. watching Watchmen. That is our title. Yes. Um, yes. Also go on Facebook. Like I said, uh, we are on there as well with a group. Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen, and definitely subscribe. Yeah, if you're on Facebook anyway, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, if you want to be on Facebook anyway, you know, come check us out. <laughs> join the party. I mean, join the community. I mean, you know, you could argue, you could argue <laughs> with your uncle that disagrees with you about politics. Sure, that's what it's for. That's everyone knows. That's what Mark Zuckerberg was exactly. thinking when he designed it. But you can also <laughs> stop by our page and say something about the podcast, and or just something about the comic. We can. Uh, enjoy so we, we'd love to hear from you yeah we definitely would love to hear from you so um we are going to um sign off here and get to the next chapter so um yeah we shall see you when we see you yeah yeah hey thanks so much to all the nerd psychos that listen you know to, uh, you know uh also to my uh my wife holly thank you again for thank you with us. thank you holly <laughs> okay, hope bye. you enjoy bye Yep, hope you still enjoy after this. (laughs) (laughs) All right, we'll see you guys. See you.